sport as mass entertainment is a product of the 19th century. It came in many countries with the growth of cities and railways. Today, it's a worldwide commercial industry. But in Ireland, the purpose was not sport alone, nor was it commercial. For the national games grew out of a broad, popular revival. After the famine that killed a million, the immigration of a million more, the evictions and bitterness of the land war, there was a resurgence of spirit. It led to a struggle for independence in politics, industry, language and literature. And it began in the field of sport. The driving force was Michael Cusick from Cairn in County Clare, teacher and journalist, athlete and agitator. Cusick called a meeting for Hayes' Hotel in Thurles, County Tipperary. There, on the 1st of November, 1884, he and a handful of others founded the Gaelic Athletic Association, the GAA. Within three years, Cusick could write, it has swept the country like a prairie fire. Gaelic football, like his counterparts in other countries, began as something of a cross-country brawl. Hurling has a purer and an older pedigree. First recorded in the sagas of pre-Christian Ireland, it was developed under the landlords of the 18th century and it was a particular passion of Michael Cusack. What was the GAA established for, he once asked? Was it not to emancipate the working man? But it came to mean even more than that, for the founders took one crucial decision that made it an integral part of the community. They ruled that the club should be based on the smallest unit of social life, the parish. It was this that rooted the GAA in every hearth and street and townland. It made it an extension of the family and the home. Common Camogiachta Nungail was founded in 1904. Edwardian dress was no help in a sister game to hurling, though goalkeepers may have found it useful. Camogie is still run by a separate organisation, but very close to the GAA. The first president of the GAA was Ireland's most popular athlete of the time, Morris Davin of Carrick and Shure, County Tipperary. And the Gaelic Athletic Association was not so called without reason. Running, jumping and throwing were the people's favourite sports. Many Irishmen held world records and some were to win Olympic medals for other countries. But competition was not open to everyone. Irish athletics were controlled by an upper-class body whose rules excluded mechanics, artisans and labourers. This meant, in effect, most of the people. The GAA's initial success was in organising athletics meetings in opposition to the controlling body. They drew large entries and vast crowds. It was a few years before hurling and Gaelic football became the premier sports that they are today. The GAA continued to run athletics until 1922, when the last Irish national championships under their control were held in a croke park that had a permanent cycling track. After the Easter Rising of 1916 came the War of Independence. The GAA was not involved as an organisation, but many of its members were. When a Galway City GAA committee was photographed in 1920, the volunteers among them wore their uniforms. And ever since Harleys had been carried in Parnell's funeral, they were a symbol of insurrection and a useful substitute for drilling when guns were in short supply. But all of this made the GAA suspect to the British authorities with tragic results. On November 21st, 1920, half of this Tipperary team were here in Croke Park in a challenge match against Dublin. British intelligence agents had been assassinated that morning. In retaliation, British forces attacked Croke Park and opened fire. A Tipperary player, Michael Hogan, was killed along with 12 others. That was Bloody Sunday. In 1922, the GAA took over another traditional Irish game, handball. Today, handball is mainly an indoor game. It's played by people of all ages throughout the year. It is also the only truly international of the Irish games. The aspirations of the Irish revival were very broad. Independence not just in politics, but in culture, industry and labour too. 
One of its main planks was the revival of the declining Irish language. And with Cusick a native speaker, the language revival became part of GAA philosophy. It still is, though some of its practice is a matter of form, like printing the players' names in Irish above the English. But the language has a living presence too, and Irish is still the automatic language on ceremonial occasions. <laughs> When the captain is a native speaker, it's more than just a ceremony, and the crowd knows it. Sunday after Sunday for a hundred years, the people of Ireland have thrilled to their own distinctive games. The GAA has been many things in its time. A cultural revival, a political reality, a social force. But it remains one of the great amateur sporting organizations of the world. Something that grew out of a meeting in a small hotel and the dream of a man from a cottage in County Clare. <laughs> 